Okay, so as a professor, I lecture all the time with microphones, but never with one like this. So, uh, All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, inclusion of internal tides and the internal gravity wave continuum spectrum in global operational ocean models. So I think essentially I was brought here because they wanted to, one person to tell you about tides. Um, so uh, this is work done with many co-authors. Uh, I'm summarizing in these talks something like 20 papers um, in two days. And uh, these are all the people that have helped. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, my sponsors from uh, the US National Science Foundation, NASA, the US Naval Research Laboratory, and the US Office of Naval Research. Uh, so before I begin talking about internal tides and waves, a couple more things. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. I would also like to thank them for inviting several African students to this. I believe there's something like six African students here, and I've met uh, most or perhaps all of them. Uh, I, this is a personal passion of mine. You'll see why in a second. I would like to see more uh, African oceanographers and other scientists in international meetings such as this one. So. If you go to the AGU Ocean Sciences meeting, it's very obvious that Africa is the continent that's left out of the meeting. There's just not that many African oceanographers, yet it's the second biggest continent in the world with a huge uh, sh uh, shoreline and all kinds of interesting problems uh, that are worth looking at. So I'm running a school in Africa that arises uh, from my history there. Uh, 27 years ago, I was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer teacher in rural northern Ghana. That's me back then. Um, and I had to teach electricity uh, in a school that did not have electricity. Um, so I taught math and physics to these students, and years went by, and uh, many of them got a hold of me again, and I started finding out how successful they were. Uh, Adam Udo-Akilo is now the member of parliament for that district. That's like being a congressperson uh, in the U.S. Um, and Joseph Ansong, I found out by total coincidence, was getting a Ph.D. in applied math from someone I know very well, um, Bruce Sutherland. So I hired him into my lab as a postdoc after not even knowing where he was for 20 years. And he's gone back to Ghana as a faculty member, and we and a few others have formed this uh, summer school in Ghana, Coastal Ocean Environment Summer School. We have a website. So in 2015, we had our first school at Regional Maritime University. It's a small world here, so Mike uh, uh, McFadden is sitting in the back, and you'll recognize your former postdoc, Ebenezer, who uh, is one of the instructors for this school. He's originally from Ghana. And um, then the school got bigger in 2016. And uh, we, we did a field trip to the beach. That's Drew Lucas from Scripps. And we also had some labs. And this last year, we even had a boat uh, trip where students, uh, African students, deployed drifters in the ocean, and many of them got seasick. Um, so uh, this coming year, we're going to be going to the University of Ghana, and we have European participation. Ricardo Farnetti, uh, who some of you know uh, from Italy, uh, he's coming and he's providing, so his organization is providing funding. And we have Peter Frenzel from Germany as well. So uh, that's all I'm going to say. I just, uh, I'm very pleased to see Africans here. And I'm pleased to see that, uh, well, I want to see African oceanography develop. Okay, so back to uh, the internal waves and tides. So this uh, slide, if you look at it on the slide deck, it's arranged as one long talk. Uh, one PowerPoint for two talks. I'm talking again on Wednesday. Uh, the first half uh, for today is on motivation, introduction, and basics. The second half is on research results and a look forward to future challenges. Uh, this first part has more text and more equations. The second part is almost all figures, the part on Wednesday. So let's start by defining what an internal gravity wave is. An eternal gravity wave is a gravity wave that's internal to the ocean, so it has much larger signals at depth than it does at the surface. And I like to always say internal gravity waves instead of internal waves because there are internal waves that are not internal gravity waves, in other words, internal Rossby waves. So internal Rossby waves are uh, waves that the uh, restoring force is a potential vorticity gradient, and internal gravity waves are 
internal waves or their stirring forces, gravity. So in a layer model, um, internal gravity waves, which I'll keep using this to, as a shorthand for, they exist on the interface uh, between layers. So as a little schematic to start off, this is from my colleague uh, Harper Simmons, who wrote this nice paper that I'm on, I'll show more of later. This is a schematic for layered models, so I'm sure you've all seen this kind of thing. If you use a layered model of the ocean, you say that each layer has a, a depth, a, or a thickness, an instantaneous thickness, little h1. It has various densities that increase as you go down. Um, and so the uh, internal gravity wave undulations are going to show up as temperature variants in instrumental records because if you have colder water down here and you're, this thing lifts, lifts it up and you have an instrument sitting here, then and it's in warm water. Now I'm in cold water, so I see that as a temperature variance. More on that in a second. Um, so the frequencies of internal gravity waves, according to classical linear internal gravity wave theory, are that the uh, frequency omega is greater than the Coriolis frequency and less than the buoyancy frequency. So the fact that it's greater than the Coriolis frequency means it's super inertial. They're not geostrophic. Um, now, if they are, and this actually, I made a mistake. This should be greater than or equal, less than or equal. Um, so uh, if the frequency is near F, then these are called near inertial waves, driven primarily by rapidly changing winds. If they have tidal frequency, then they're called internal tides. And these are driven by barotropic tidal flow over topography. So essentially what happens is that if you have flow over a bump, that's obviously going to cause vertical motions. Vertical motions in a stratified fluid implies that the interfaces move up and down at tidal frequencies. Now, beyond tidal frequencies, at supertidal frequencies, there's an internal gravity wave continuum, famously described by Garrett and Monk. And the classical picture there is that it's thought to arise from nonlinear interactions between near inertial waves and tides. So uh, I hope you've all seen that, you know, if you have a, a nonlinear term, just imagine you have cosine i omega t times cosine i omega t, then that gives you cosine i omega 1 t plus omega 2 t. The, the frequencies can add or subtract, and so you can quickly build up a spectrum of some and different frequencies. So the idea is you put energy in at a couple frequencies, and then nonlinear actions start spreading that energy around to all kinds of frequencies, and you fill the spectrum up. So here's an example, a temperature variance spectrum from a mooring in black and from three different global simulations of the MIT GCM, 1 12th degree, 1 24th degree, and 1 48th degree. So that, that's currently, as far as I know, the largest global simulation in the world, 1 48th degree. Uh, HICOM, we've run 1 12th and 1 25th, but not yet uh, 1 48th. So if you look at this frequency spectra, uh, this is cycles per day. So one cycle per day is a diurnal tide. Two cycles per day is the semi-diurnal tide. Subtidal frequencies are dominated by mesoscale eddies and currents. And this here is the Garrett Monk spectrum, the supertidal stuff. And so the MIT model, you can see that as you increase the resolution from 1 12th degree to 1 24th degree to 1 48th degree, you inch closer to that internal gravity wave continuum spectrum. So this may not look like a particularly exciting plot, but um, two years ago, we published the first paper showing that models like the ones I'm going to describe here actually have a partial internal gravity wave continuum. So this is really new stuff. I mean, the fact that models can do this is just a few years old, OK? Now, why should we care about global internal tide and internal gravity wave continuum models? So first of all, internal tides and internal gravity waves are important signals in operational oceanography. They're visible in many measurements. For instance, temperature variance measurements from moorings, just as one example of many. Um, they impact acoustics, which is why the US Navy cares about it. The speed of sound is a sensitive function of temperature and salinity. So internal gravity waves and also mesoscale eddies affect uh, acoustics, which affects anti-submarine warfare. Um, they also can take submarines and push them up and down, just like when you're in an airplane and the pilot says there's turbulence. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Um, 
Okay, so reason number two is that global internal tide and uh, internal gravity of continuum modeling is important for the SWAT mission that I think you've been hearing about, right? That's been discussed. So uh, SWAT is going to measure length scales at uh, greater accuracy than uh, the Topex Poseidon series. So uh, some of you might not know this, but altimetry would not work without very accurate barotropic tide models that are used to so you use the altimeter to make the tide models and learn about tides, but then once you have the accurate maps, you subtract the tides out so that you can study all kinds of other interesting motions like El Nino and eddies and everything else. Well, once you go down to smaller uh, length scales, then you're going to have to worry about internal tides. Um, and so basically SWAT is going to tell us a lot about internal tides and internal gravity waves, but at the same time, you'll need to subtract those out to see all the other glorious motions uh, of the ocean. And so uh, coherent or, or stationary uh, internal tides, more about that later, I have some predictability, but the incoherent internal tides which arise from internal tides being scattered by eddies and things like that, and especially the internal gravity wave continuum spectrum, that's likely to have less predictability. So right now all we can do is use models like this to map the problem and then uh, someday, hopefully, we'll be able to actually try to remove some of that signal. Okay, another reason, of course, to run models like this is that most oceanic mixing below the mixed layer is due to breaking internal gravity waves, which, as many people have argued, impacts the meridional overturning circulation. I'm one of those people that kind of always puts that sentence in my paper and then doesn't really think about it after that. I, I will admit that. Um, but anyway, that's... Uh, Mixing is important. Um, and then uh, also, um, oh, sorry, Th these global models, of course, don't actually resolve breaking, uh, but they do quantify the transport of these waves around basins. You're going to see that in a minute. And then the fourth reason to study models like this is that it's just interesting in and of themselves. So the internal tides and continuum spectrum are an important and interesting class of motions, and global models might help us understand their dynamics just like models uh, always do, right? All models are always good. Okay, so according to the classical paradigm, if you want to have internal gravity wave continuums in global models, you have to have frequently updated wind forcing. So what I, what, the reason I emphasize frequently updated is that if you just have a steady wind, you're not going to generate near inertia waves. You have to have winds that are updated a lot. Now, of course, just as an aside, one way to do that is to have truly coupled ocean models because then the winds are updated every time step in the model. Just as an aside, that's one reason I'm a fan of that kind of work um, that Chris Harris talked about. But anyway, if you, if, if you have an ocean-only model, then you gotta hit it often, like hourly is good. Of course, you need the astronomical tidal forcing to generate the barotropic tides, which then flow over the topography and generate the internal tides. And then you need to have high horizontal and vertical resolution because you have to have high resolution so that you get the nonlinear interactions that actually push energy into that continuum spectrum. So you need a high resolution model with wind plus tidal forcing. And so I'm going to discuss the modeling history leading up to that. So sorry there's a lot of words at the beginning, but it'll get better later. So uh, until recently, global tide modeling, global modeling of atmospherically driven motions were separate art forms. Okay, so eddying basin scale models came about at the turn of the century. Uh, Eric talked about that, uh, uh, papers with MICOM and, and with uh, POP. And then uh, we now have global eddying models such as HICOM and uh, many others. Now, <coughs> global tide modeling was barotropic or one layer for many years. Um, so my personal hero in this endeavor was Merle Hendershot, uh, who I think was Mike's advisor. Um, I just know some of these things because I've talked to Merle a lot. Uh, anyway, um, so I asked him what was the resolution of his tide model in the 1970s. He said six degrees. Uh, so a six degree model, he had to use punch cards and all the bathymetry. There was no Smith and Sandball bathymetry back then, so he just pretty much hand did that. Um, at the time of Topex Poseidon launch, the models that were used to detide the altimeter data were around one degree. And my colleague, Martin Bowsman, is now running uh, barotropic tide models at 175th degree uh, resolution, which does give better answers than 125th degree, so it has not yet converged. 
Now, the first baroclinic tide models were actually regional models that were forced at their boundaries by barotropic tides. Okay, then a little bit about motiv motivating observational studies. So some of you have probably heard of these famous results, but there's a, there are a few really crucial results that motivated the study of internal tides in general, including the global modeling I'll talk about. So first of all, in old current meter records, people tended to find that internal tides were fairly incoherent. This was often because they were looking at velocity, which is a little more incoherent, and they often were looking at shelves where things are just, um, you know, the shelves are just so active that the tides aren't quite as coherent. Um, so it was a bit of a surprise to some people when Brian Dushaw used acoustic tomography to show that actually internal tides seem to propagate coherently over long distances. Again, I'll show that pictorially in a second. And then I'll also show the result that Ray and Mitchum followed up, you know, that you can see this in altimetry. So these internal tides seem to propagate long distances, and what that means is they can transport energy long distances before breaking uh, somewhere else. Now, Richard Ray was also involved in another stellar result. Uh, so for many years, people thought that tidal dissipation occurred all along the shelves where the tidal velocities are much, much larger. It is still the case, even after their work, that that's the dominant sink, but they showed that about 25 to 30 percent of the total tidal dissipation, 3.5 terawatts, takes place in the deep ocean. What and it's very clear that what's happening is that you're generating internal tides over, say, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and then those internal tides break and lose energy. So let me now show some plots from these famous studies so you get the idea. So here's one of the plots from, Rich, from Ray and Mitchum's famous paper on internal tides and altimetry. So you're looking at the amplitude of M2, that stands for moon twice daily, the principal lunar semidernal tide uh, in centimeters along a particular track. You know, that's Topex lingo. So you're looking along a particular track, and what you see is that you can draw um, a low-pass curve through there. This, this large-scale signature is the dominant signature. That is the large-scale barotropic tide. But superimposed on top of that is the baroclinic tide. This is the baroclinic tide. Much shorter scales because it's a baroclinic motion. Measurable but smaller amplitude. And so this showed from altimetry that you have these coherent tides propagating over very long distances. You see this is, you know, basin scale. Then Ray, another hero of mine, <laughs> um, came up with this paper that I discussed where they used Gary Egbert's TPXO model and Richard Ray's model, and they, th these are inverse models, and from those they deduced how much tidal energy dissipation was taking place around the world. And you see a lot of it in coastal areas, as I've mentioned earlier, but the new thing was that, gee, there seems to be a lot of dissipation along rough topography such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So again, that's related to the mechanism of generating internal tides there that propagate and, and dissipate. Okay, so getting back to the history. So the first basin scale internal tide model was done by Niwa and Hibia. And then the first global internal tide simulations were done by myself and Harper Simmons uh, back when we were young. Um, and uh, so these simulations uh, only had tidal forcing. We wanted to keep it simple. We had no atmospheric forcing. And since we didn't have atmospheric forcing, we couldn't have a realistic horizontally varying stratification. So we just said, let's take a profile in the subtropics and pretend that that holds everywhere around the globe. So I'm going to show you some movies of those first uh, simulations. So I always like to do it this way. First, I'll show you my movie. And then you'll see why Harper's paper was cited more than mine. Um, so, so my movie here shows the barotropic tides on the left. Um, again, this is M2, principal lunar semidernal tide. You have the large-scale barotropic tides at the sea surface, sea surface height anomaly. And they're, they're large-scale, and they're propagating like this, just like Kelvin wave theory tells you they should. And then associated with these elevations, you have tidal currents, which generate the internal tides, as I described. And so here is a movie of the um, interfacial height elevations. And so you can see, that again, that they have much um, 
smaller horizontal scale, and they have a larger vertical scale, so you have to multiply by 10. And this is actually really badly resolved, I realize now years later. A quarter degree is just, it's crazy that I published that. Um, you really have to have higher resolution to get these things. But anyway, so you see the internal waves. These are, these are the waves on the interface between layer one and layer two. And so now Harper, being a brilliant movie maker, did a, a better movie of the internal tides. So the one thing he did was he um, started from rest. And the other thing he did is just made a better color bar. So you see the, um, the internal tides growing from rest. So again, the reds and the blues are highs and lows of the layer interface between layers. He also ran at higher resolution. And you can see this whole thing takes about 20 days. At the end of that 20 days, the internal tides have filled up the basin. So again, these are the first global simulations of this phenomenon. And we showed these to people like Rob Pinkle and that who study mixing and they got very excited. And, and um, anyway, so Harper and I have uh, done well from doing these simulations. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's all for the movies for today. All right, so last slide on the history, I think, or close to it. So it's common to include atmospheric and tidal forcing in coastal models. We, we have to say that. You know, coastal modelers were way ahead of global modelers in that uh, sense. But in global models, the first ones to have wind and tidal forcing, that, that's a typo, should say, tidal, uh, were done with actually pretty coarse resolution. So the first ones to do at high resolution was uh, me working with my HICOM collaborators. So these are the first ones where you had tides and winds at eddy resolving type resolutions. And so what that means is that um, you get mesoscale eddies, barotropic tides, and baroclinic tides all at the same time in the model. And I'll show a movie from that uh, next time. Right, okay, sorry, this is the last one on the history, I promise. So several groups are now doing these global wind plus tides runs at res high resolution. Uh, German group has done a little bit. Uh, Harper Simmons has continued to work with the gold model. And some of you have probably heard about these very impressive MIT simulations. I showed one result uh, earlier down, a 148th degree global simulation with several petabytes of uh, output ran on 70,000 cores, all kinds of impressive numbers. Um, I've had personal communications from operational centers in France and the UK Met Office indicating that they also are gearing up to do this kind of run. So I think it's just inevitable that global models are going to start including tides uh, eventually. So the focus in the rest of these talks, uh, I'm going to talk about forward modeling of internal tides in the continuum spectrum in HICOM and the MIT GCM. I'll show a few results employing a Kalman filter to improve the barotropic tides in HICOM. Um, the ability of global models to partially resolve the continuous spectrum, as I mentioned, is only two years old. I mean, people didn't know you could do this until we published this two years ago, that you could do the continuum. Um, so the HICOM wind plus tide simulations have been around longer. I'm comparing these two models now. We've been around longer. We've published way more often compared to observations a lot more. But the big advantage of their simulations, a huge advantage, is more resolution. So why, whereas the HICOM goes up to 125th, they uh, go to 148th, and they also have more vertical layers. Um, they're also a little, e it's a little easier to get their output. OK, so in terms of the forcing that you need for these models, I'll just briefly mention atmospheric forcing. So the, of course. This includes buoyancy forcing, like evaporation minus precipitation, air CE fluxes, and wind stress. So it's just important to just mention that all of that sets up the background stratification. So you're not going to get internal waves, which are waves in a stratified fluid, unless you have the stratification, which mostly is, well, almost all is coming from the atmospheric forcing. And as I mentioned, the atmospheric forcing also drives near inertial waves, amongst other things. It's worth a little brief digression that a third component that's not always done in global ocean models is to have atmospheric pressure loading. So um, atmospheric pressure loading drives motions across many frequencies. 
And there's actually thermal tides in the atmosphere I can describe later if you're interested in these details. Uh, but the atmospheric S1 thermal tide pressure forcing on the ocean drives an oceanic S1 tide. That's exactly 24 hour period. And the atmospheric S2 thermal tide pressure forcing accounts for about 15% of the oceanic S2 tide. Uh, this is the only paper in my career that doesn't have any co-authors. Um, so, um, it, but it, anyway, so I show that it's like 15% of that tide, which happens to be the second largest tide in the ocean. Okay, I want to mention another thing is bathymetry. So bathymetry is crucial for internal tides as well as pretty much everything else in the ocean. And so it's worth pointing out that all global bathymetries are, that I know of at least are based upon the Smith and Sandwell database with regional patches. They use acoustic soundings uh, where they're available and altimetry elsewhere. So you can use altimetry, one of the, you know, altimetry does so many things, including bathymetry because mass anomalies will drive a sea surface height anomalies. So to them, everything else is noise, but they can pick out the bathymetry. And the reason that's important is because ship soundings are not as um, uh, available as you might think. So here is, this map is essentially a density of ship soundings in the North Atlantic, which is the best sampled basin in the world. And so these are places where campaigns have gone out by marine geophysicists to look in detail at the mid-ocean ridges, but look at what's happening elsewhere. So how do you fill in this data? Well, you use altimetry, okay? So it's just worth pointing out that um, altimetry, a favorite tool of many of us, uh, is used for uh, uh, bathymetry. But it doesn't pick up scales less than about 10 to 20 kilometers, okay? so. Um, and that's important because those, that smaller scale roughness actually does generate a lot of internal wave activity, including internal tides. So that's actually something that's totally missing from, well, not totally, but almost totally, except for a few spots, missing from global data sets. Um, so it's just worth remembering that our ability to run high resolution models has already far outstripped the, the true feature resolution of the bathymetry underneath. Um, and so, uh, John Goff, who's one of the masters of this kind of marine geophysics, wrote a paper with me uh, saying that, you know, you can fill that in with statistical techniques if, if you're interested. I just wanted to mention that briefly. Okay, so the astronomical tidal forcing. So this is the sentence, and then I'll show some pictures. Um, tides are due to the differential gravitational force of a distant body across a body of finite size, like the Earth. So the Earth has finite size, the Moon is over here, and the Moon's gravity is different at different places on the Earth. So, so let's make some guesses about the tidal formula dependencies. So uh, what's Newton's law of gravity? What's the formula? Most of you have had it. Are you saying it? What's that? G GMM over R squared. So G, big G is Newton's gravitational constant. The two M's are the two masses involved and over the R squared. So um, that's what it depends on. So um, does it depend on the Earth's radius, that formula? No. So the key thing here is that if you're thinking about only the motion of the Earth's center of mass, like you're treating the Earth as a point, then you know you just care about that GMM over R squared. The fact that the Earth has size doesn't matter. But what happens with tides is you're saying there's a, a I don't know if you want to call it a secondary effect, that you have to care about the fact that the gravity is different here versus here versus here because the Earth has a finite size. Okay, so. As I just told you, I just answered this question. Not a very good professor technique here. The, the tidal force will depend on the Earth's radius. Now, what do you think exerts a greater gravitational force on the Earth in terms of the center of mass, the moon or the sun? So hint, which one do we revolve around, the moon or the sun? The sun. So the sun's gravitational force on the Earth is actually much greater than the moon's. But which one exerts a greater tidal force? The moon. And that's because 
if you differentiate 1 over r squared, you get minus 2 over r cubed. And so another factor of the distance comes in. So in terms of the tidal force, the moon wins. But in terms of the raw gravitational force, the sun wins. I hope that was reasonably clear. Um, so here is the center of the Earth, and here is the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system, and here is the moon. And what this diagram is trying to show you is that the center of the Earth revolves around the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system. Obviously, the moon is also moving during that progression. And essentially what that means is that the entire Earth is doing this. It's all, every point on the Earth is tracing out circles with a radius equal to this distance here. So that means they're all experiencing the same centripetal force uh, drawn here. Okay, so everywhere is experiencing the same centripetal force. So the tides are due to the difference between that centripetal force, which exactly equals the gravitational force at the center of the Earth, and the, and the actual gravitational force at a point, which varies because the Earth has finite size. So here, the gravitational force is greater than the centripetal force, so this minus this gives you net force this way. And here, the gravitational force is less, so this minus this gives you net force this way. So you get your tidal bulges like that. And so one bulge is facing the moon, one bulge is on the other side, and the Earth turns underneath that, and you see two high equilibrium tides per day and two low equilibrium tides per day. Some textbooks will make it seem as if this is the tide, which is wrong. This is the tidal forcing. This is the equilibrium tide. The actual tide is a complex response to that forcing, as we'll discuss in a bit. So a little bit of mathematics. So the centripetal force is that gm moon over r squared. We already defined those terms. I'm being a little imprecise here. That r should probably be the distance from the moon to the Earth's Earth moon center of mass. But anyway, the math is all the same. So on the side of the Earth closest to the moon, the gravitational pull is that same formula, except you replace r by r minus a. And so then if you difference those, you have gm moon times 1 over r minus a squared or 1 over a r squared. Now, the Earth's radius, A, is much, much less, about 1 60th of the distance to the moon. So you can take advantage of that. You expand this out. This is R squared minus 2AR, which is the same as R squared times this. And then you can neglect the plus A squared because that's small times small, so you neglect that. Then, because this is still small, 1 over 1 minus a small number is 1 plus the small number. So 1 minus 1 cancels. You have the 2a over r. You multiply by this, and there's your formula. So it goes like r cubed, as I mentioned before, and their Earth's radius enters in. So on the side of the Earth farthest from the moon, it's almost the same. There you take r plus plus a squared, and you work out the math. And to first order, it's the same thing with a minus sign. So you have bulges on both sides. So as I alluded to earlier, the sun's mass is far greater than that of the moon, but the distance is also greater. So if you take this over this cubed, you get 0.45. So the solar tides are important, but smaller uh, than the lunar tides. But if you look at g over, uh, so if you look at the, this thing over this thing squared, so if you're just concerned about the motion of the Earth's center of mass, then the sun is 177 times stronger. So again, the raw gravity of the sun, you know, which is influencing the motion of the Earth's center of mass, is much stronger than that of the moon. But the differential force of gravity, because it's so far away, is less uh, powerful. So what are the periods of the principal lunar and solar semi-diurnal tides? So you can get that from this picture here. So um, when you become a tide person, you, ha you realize that you can't be quite so casual about what you mean by the word day. Okay, so the, a day is actually a solar day. It's measured against seeing the same point on the sun. So that means that the solar day is 24 hours. The, the period of the principal solar semi-diurnal tide is half that. That's 12 hours. But for a lunar day, you know, you got a little observer here looking up at the moon, and as the Earth is turning, the thing is the moon is also moving in orbit around the Earth. And so 24 hours later, the moon isn't overhead anymore, so you have to go a little bit further to catch up. 
And so the lunar day is 24.84 hours. So the period of the principal lunar seminarial tide, M2, is 12.42 hours. So there you go. Those are the two, two of the, well, M2 is the largest tide in the ocean. S2 and K1 are, are the next ones. So um, spring tide is when the earth, moon, and sun are all lined up like this so that the lunar and solar equilibrium tides are acting together. So you get an especially high, high equilibrium tide, and then the response follows because the tides are mostly linear. Neptide is, um, is when the earth, moon, sun are like this, and so the, the moon is pulling an equilibrium tide like this, and the sun is working against it, so the highs aren't so high and the lows aren't so low. Does anyone here play Scrabble? Is that a common thing in Europe? Yep. So this is called syzygy, S-Y-G-Y-Z-Y. -Y -Y. Good Scrabble word. <laughs> All right, so the last thing I want to mention is declination. Um, so, you know, here is the plane of the, of the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and the Earth's axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees to that, and the moon's axis is tilted 5 degrees to that, so what that means is the moon's position is actually 28 and a half degrees uh, tilted uh, from the Earth's equator. So if you look at this equilibrium tide like this, as the Earth is spinning, what that means is that an observer says, I have a high tide here and another one here, high equilibrium tide, but they're unequal. So once per day, you notice that the equilibrium tides, the t twice per day ones are different. Mathematically, that essentially means that there's a tidal forcing at 24 hours. So that's the cause of diurnal tides. One other quick sketch on that. Um, so here's an observer here at, say, 28 north. And when they see a high, high tide, an observer at 28 south sees a low, high tide, and vice versa. The low, high gives you a high, high down there. So that means that the diurnal tides are anti-symmetric. So you should see something in the math that, that tells you that when this is high, this is low, and vice versa, and you will see that. Uh, one other thing worth mentioning is when you look at monthly tidal curves, um, most places in the world are like San Francisco, California, where you have two high tides per day that are clearly unequal and two low tides that are unequal. That means that both the semidernal and diurnal tides are fairly significant. There are, so most places are like that. There's a fair number of places where the semidernal tide is by far stronger, and so then you get pretty much two equal highs and lows per day. Uh, and then there's a few places in the world, that, like this one in China, where the diurnal tides dominate. That's why it's stretched out more like that. But all places see a spring neap cycle. So one way to understand that is when the Earth, Moon, and Sun are in a line. But another way to understand that is when you have different frequencies that are nearby, you get this frequency beating that's common in you know, electronics and all kinds of things. So that's another way to think about it. So there's the neptide where the tidal range between high and low is not so great, spring tide where it is large. So now, having gone through all that, you know, a lot of those pictures, as you probably imagine, I actually use in an intro uh, course. Uh, but of course, you know, at a higher level, you're going to use a lot more mathematics. And the more rigorous derivation of tidal forcing comes from expanding the astronomical gravitational potential in terms of spherical harmonics which can be done like that today. But imagine what it was like for this English gentleman back in 1921. He spent, I believe, 20 years of his life computing 400 frequencies in the tidal potential. And these cluster into three species, we call them. There's the semidernal tides with periods near twice per day, diurnal tides near once per day, and then longer period tides. And all these frequencies, these 400 frequencies, they represent multiple sums and differences of the various frequencies in the Earth, Moon, Sun system. There's a lot more than you realize. You know, there's a month, a lunar day, a solar day. There's another definition of day. I hope you've heard of this called sidereal day. That's a day measured against the distant stars. That's not exactly the same either. That's uh, four minutes short of a solar day. So that one comes in. Anyway, there's all these different, so sums, multiples, differences of all that. Um, and in ocean tide models, um, another interesting thing, which Merle Hendershot, my hero, 
uh, realized is that the astronomical tidal potential has to be adjusted to account for what's called solid Earth body tides. Okay, so sorry about this. Do not read all these words. This is from my chapter that I'm writing. But the main thing is to see this formula. So this adjustment here is due to the solid Earth body tides. So the solid Earth also responds to astronomical forcing. And what that means is that the seafloor that you're measuring your water column thickness is moving up and down. You have to account for that. That's this number. And then because the Earth is doing this, the self-gravity of all that changes the gravitational potential. That's this number. These numbers can change a little bit with frequency because of a resonance within the solid Earth near diurnal periods. So that's those numbers. But anyway, the, the equilibrium tide for a, for a semi-diurnal constituent looks like this. There's an amplitude, which is going to be different for M2, S2, whatever. There's these uh, body tide corrections I just mentioned, which are about a 30% correction, so important. Cosine squared of latitude. You have cosine omega times t minus t ref. So when you're running a tide model, t ref could be the beginning of the year that you're running the model in or something like that. Um, there's an astronomical argument, which is essentially telling you where the moon is or, or the sun, reference to that time. Uh, there is a factor of twice longitude, so that means if you freeze time and go around the Earth, you're going to see two highs and two lows consistent with that picture we developed earlier. And then there's these nodal factors here. And basically what's going on there is that if you want to force a tide model with the full lunisolar potential that includes those 400 constituents, you can do that. But people don't usually do that because it's just kind of a hassle. They tend to have a smaller number of constituents. If you have a smaller number of constituents, then any important constituent you're interested in is modulated slowly by those other frequencies that are there in nature. And that's what these things account for. So that's for a semi-diurnal tide. This is for a diurnal tide. Looks pretty similar, but sine is an odd function. So if you change the latitude to the negative latitude, you get a negative, which means it's anti-symmetric consistent with those pictures I showed you earlier. When you're in the northern hemisphere and you have a high in the southern hemisphere, it's going to be a low. And then the other difference is that instead of twice longitude, it's only once longitude. So you're only going to seeing you know, one wave uh, at any time in the forcing. And then there's these long period tides, which have a, another different latitude dependence and no longitudinal dependence. And they're very interesting, but kind of small. So I'm not going to say any more about them in these lectures. So do not memorize these numbers. But just to give you an idea, these are 10 constituents that are commonly used in tide models. So these are the four largest semi-diurnal tides. They all have periods close to 0 0.5 solar days. Um, these are the four largest diurnal tides. This one is kind of a cool one because it has a period exactly equal to a sidereal day. Um, that's the largest diurnal tide. So they all have periods near one day. And the, the, largest, the two largest long period tides are given there. They have much longer periods. And if you look at the uh, astronomical amplitudes, before you correct for the solid Earth body tides, M2 is the largest, and S2, sorry, S2 and K1 are, are not far behind. So if you want to force these 10 in a model, you just have to take those formula, and you have one formula for M2 and another one for S2 and another one, and you just stick them all in your model one after another. OK, now here's, the, here's an even more exotic thing. So building on the work of earlier uh, greats, Hendershot also considered the yielding of the Earth to the loading by the ocean tides. So it's kind of amazing that this matters. But when you have a high tide, it compresses the Earth. When you have a low tide, the Earth expands. That means, that, again, that you're measuring the tide against your seafloor. So you have to care about that. And it means that the mass in the Earth is being deformed and the self-gravity of that changes the potential. And you also have a self-gravity of the ocean tide itself. And all this stuff put together is called self-attraction loading. And Merle Hendershot synthesized it all in that unbelievable paper of 1972. So these are computed based on spherical harmonics, which are the natural basis functions on a sphere. Um, and this is what the formula looks like. You have to take the tidal elevation, split it into spherical harmonics, 
and then you, all that physics I told you about a minute ago comes in here, and it's different for each degree because, again, that's the basis function. And so uh, one problem with this term I'll just mention is that uh, tide models aren't run in spherical harmonics, so this term is pretty expensive and painful to deal with, although Rui Ponte has, and his collaborators recently published a paper that I think is a, a big step forward in uh, doing it in, in models. Um, we also have to mention briefly drag. So, you know, ocean modelers use quadratic drag all the time. I'm not sure if all of them realize that this actually comes from tidal studies. So, the great fluid mechanist G.I. Taylor studied tidal dissipation in the Irish Sea, and it is from that study that he came up with the CDU squared drag that we all know and love. So it has a tidal history, so we use it in tide models. As I mentioned, it dissipates tidal energy primarily on shells. Now, since this wonderful paper by Steve Jane and Lou St. Laurent, many of us, when we run forward barotropic tide models, we include a parameterized topographic internal wave drag. So essentially, we're saying we know we generate internal waves over rough topography, as Egbert and Ray showed. So we parameterize that and put it as a drag term in our models. I won't show you the math, but I'll just tell you that. Um, one important philosophical question that we still argue about, all of us, is whether global internal tide models, which are resolving some of the internal tide motions, should actually include a wave drag. So the idea is maybe if you're resolving some and parameterizing, maybe you're double counting. Um, I've consistently argued they still need it, and my argument has been, and not everyone buys this, so I will honestly tell you, my argument has been that you're generating some of the spectrum, but you're not, you're not resolving any of the breaking. And so you, I think you still have to have something in there as a damping mechanism. But I'm, again, not everyone buys that argument. More on that in the second talk. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, the oceanic tides do not equal that equilibrium tide for several reasons. So tides travel as shallow water waves, square root g times the depth. The ocean is not deep enough for the shallow water waves to travel fast enough to actually keep up with the moon. They can't do it. That's reason number one. But there are other reasons. Continents get in the way. You can't have that bulge thing going all around the Earth when you have continents. You have friction. You have the Coriolis force. And then you have uh, Merle's solid Earth body and load tide. Merle didn't invent those things. He just said, you got to put them in an ocean tide model. That was what he did. <clears throat> but anyway, all those complications mean that the real response is complex. It's a dynamical response to the equilibrium tidal forcing that, and here's the equations that you use, for instance, for a one-layer tide model. So most of you have seen the shallow water equations. You have du dt, that's velocity. You have nonlinear advection, of course. There is Coriolis. And a lot of times when you're running a shallow water model, you just stop there, but the gradient of the sea surface perturbation. But when you're running a tide model, you have to reference that against the Newton-Laplace equilibrium tide and the Hendershot SAL term. Um, I've never said this in front of Merle, but I just, if you think about it, like, you know, Navier-Stokes, Coriolis, Newton-Laplace, Hendershot. Um, anyway, um, here's your eddy viscosity. There's your Taylor quadratic drag. And there's um, a tensor form of the uh, wave drag, which, you know, spatially varying wave drag over rough topography. And there, there's your usual mass conservation equation. Resting height, perturbation height. You've all seen that kind of stuff before. Uh, I think I'm almost done with formulas. Um, just a couple more. Because the tides are periodic, we can write a lot of tidal things as amplitude maps of latitude and longitude times that um, nodal factor, if appropriate. Cosine omega t minus t reference, the astronomical argument, the other nodal factor, minus a phase. So the main thing here is we're just saying that, for, forgetting all that other stuff, you, you can make an amplitude map and you can make a phase map. So here's an instance of that, example of that. So this is one of the great tide models by Gary Egbert, the TPXO model, one of the um, most widely used models. So here in Europe, the FES model of Florent Liard is another great one. Anyway, um, so this is what the amplitudes look like. And if you remember that one movie where I showed these things moving around, you remember they had large scales. And these are the phase lines. So basically, that's meaning that 
as those blobs travel around as Kelvin waves, they're here, you have a high tide here, then here, then here, then here. That's what these phase lines represent. So um, a lot of times with tidal variables, we can make maps like this. So, so here is a map for the M2 sea surface height elevations. You can make another map for the K1 elevations and another one for the S2 elevations and so forth. And so the more constituents you have, it can start getting out of hand. Um, and this is just the elevations, then you have currents. But anyway, you get the idea. These sort of things are used all the time in the tidal literature. Um, and I think this is the last formula. Um, incredibly brief synopsis of internal gravity wave theory. Um, so in the appendix of my chapter, uh, I go through stuff that people know, but it's not actually very easy to see in textbooks. But that is, if you go through the whole sturm liouville problem for the linearized um, multi-layer equation, or continuously stratified equations, actually, you can show that the um, dispersion relation for the nth vertical mode, you you go through the, the um, sturm liouville problem and you get a speed for that mode, c sub n. And so the frequency squared is equal f squared, that's Coriolis, plus that speed that you find from the sturm liouville problem times the wave number squared. So that's a lot like the uh, classic, um, even more classic, uh, uh, surface gravity wave dispersion relation, which is F Poincaré wave, some people call it, which is F squared plus GHK squared, where GH is the sp square of the speed in that case. So it looks just like that, except you have to solve a sturm liouville problem to get that when you have general stratification. If you have constant stratification, it, it simplifies. And the other thing I want to mention is that Garrett and Monk um, have a very detailed model, so it's a little embarrassing that I'm only, I only have one sentence on it, but just I just want to say that they say that that internal gravity wave continuum spectrum should fall off as frequency to the minus two and as vertical uh, wave number to the minus two. Let me see where I'm at here. Um, oh yeah, awesome. So this is about, I just want to do two more slides, Jacques, and then I'll be done for today. It's a natural breaking point. So. I love tides, and, and I don't just do internal tides. I also do barotropic tides. And this is maybe a fun way to end, end this first lecture. So um, tides are thought to be resonant. Uh, many of us have written papers on this long before me, and I've also written about it. So the reason, one of the reasons we think that is physical, that the square root GH formula, if you take the open ocean depth of 4,000 meters, you get you know, 10 times 4,000 is 40,000, square root of that is 200. So 200 meters a second, that's how fast it travels. So just as an exercise, if you're interested in this, take a typical basin length and divide it by 200 meters per second, and you will find that the time it takes to cross is not too different from the forcing periods of 12 to 24 hours. So some of us think that the open ocean is in resonance, and this guy Plotzman wrote this amazing stuff about how the ocean has these normal modes that ring and they actually seem to explain the tides pretty well. Now what happens in coastal areas, then the depth is much, much less, so the speed is much smaller, but if you have a dimensions of a bay that are just right, you can also get that the time it takes for things to go in and out is similar to the forcing period, and so you can get whopping big tides in certain coastal areas. So. This is another reason it's fun to study tides. This is not internal tides, barotropic tides. But as you know, there are places like this in Europe. There are places in the world where the tides are really, really big. And so, um, anyway, so there's lots of interesting uh, studies on tidal resonance. Uh, not, nothing to do with internal tides. It's barotropic tides. But tides are fun, and uh, let's have dinner. <laughs>